Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marlon Buckner, and I am a member of the advisory board of the Tom Tom Foundation and a uh, co-founder of MP Squared Solutions. We're a Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia-based impact development firm. On behalf, <clears throat> excuse me, on behalf of our board and team, I want to thank each of you for being here today. Today's event is part of a seven-week virtual event series called the Cities Rising Summit. Cities Rising will explore critical issues surfaced by the COVID-19 pandemic and the movement for racial justice, especially as they relate to small and mid-sized cities across America. All City Rising events will be available on a pay-what-you-can scale, thanks to the support of our sponsors and community members like you. If today's program resonates with you, please consider becoming a contributing member to the Foundation. You can do so on our website, tomtownfoundation.org, hash give. The City's Rising Summit will run until October 30th, and we encourage you to get as involved as possible over the course of the coming weeks. All talks through Cities Rising will be recorded. So if you enjoyed today's session, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with colleagues and friends. Please note the chat function in the bottom right corner of your screen. You can use that to connect with other participants on the call today. Also, please note the Q&A function. You can use that to ask questions of our speakers, and our moderator will have their eyes on that channel and will include your questions into the way they steer today's conversation. The title of today's talk is 50 Cities Later, What We Learned from Our Towns and What It All Means Today. And it features two fantastic, fantastic folks, Jim and Deb Fowles well and widely known journalists, travelers, and authors of Our Towns, a 100,000 mile journey into the heart of America. And we are delighted, delighted that Jim and Deb are able to be with us today. This event is part of a week of thematic programming around small business and entrepreneurship and is brought to you by the Charlottesville Office of Economic Development and the city of Lynchburg, Virginia. We thank them both for their incredible support and collaboration in building this program. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our moderator for today. My good friend, the founder and executive director of the TomTom Tom Foundation, and a truly great American, Paul Byer. Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Marlon, thank you so much. And thank you for your service on the board, TomTom. Tom. And um, just really excited for today's talk, as you are. Indeed, absolutely. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And, uh, and thank you for joining us today um, for today's uh, exciting talk with uh, Jim and Deb Fallows. And we're going to really return to a program that uh, was one of the highlights of our 2018 in-person festival. It's hard to believe, but yes, we were once in person and uh, in bringing together hundreds of cities and city leaders to talk about the future of their hometowns. And we were thrilled that Jim and Deb in 2018 joined us to release their Our Towns book and launch the project. So this is a, this is a especially uh, fitting homecoming today and excited to introduce them in a moment. I am seeing already that the the chat uh, is lighting up with people from all over the country, Chicago, Danville, Lynchburg, Richmond, Sycamore, Illinois, Charleston, South Carolina, Fairfax, uh, the Niagara region, Kinsville, Virginia, Abington. So um, for folks that are joining us on Facebook and on um, YouTube live, uh, if you are, come to our site, there's a Zoom meeting right now where all this chat is, uh, is occurring. And, and by all means, excited to see lively activity there already. So let's, uh, let's get started. And I wanna introduce our two panelists today and bring them on. Uh, Jim and Deb Fallows, besides being wonderful human beings through and through, are um, very accomplished authors and, uh, and, and thinkers here and that to write about important issues in our country and, and our cities. Um, Deb is a New York Times bestselling author, a theoretical linguist, 
Yes, thank you for pointing yourself out <laughs> that. That's very helpful. Um, theoretical linguist, widely published slate, New York Times, National Geographic, writing on language, education, families and work, China and travel, and currently working on an HBO series, which we'll talk about later in this, uh, in this talk. And then uh, Jim Fallows, legendary journalist, 35 year veteran at the Atlantic, um, author of 11 books, uh, winner of multiple awards, specifically the 1983 National Book Award for nonfiction, finalist of the National Magazine Award in 1988, 2006, 2007, winning the award in 2003, and an Emmy winner for the documentary series on the front lines doing business in China. So, like I said, esteemed, uh, esteemed panelists today and wonderful human beings. And so welcome, welcome both of you. Thank you so much, Paul. It's so great to have this. It's, it's a, you know, I'm gonna say bittersweet, mainly sweet, but bittersweet to have this virtual reunion with Tom. Tom. We so much appreciated joining you all two and a half years ago. We look forward to being there again in person, but thank you for letting us reconnect this way. Absolutely, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Marlon, and thanks, Ben, too, for helping wrangle everything. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, the TomTom Tom team, is a, as, as many of you chiming in from across the country may resonate with, uh, we're a small little organization, but it's a small but mighty organization, and we <laughs> are thrilled to be able to work with so many uh, wonderful uh, leaders in the country. Um, well, before we get started, I, I'm a big fan of kind of sketching out at the beginning of, the, of a conversation just what are we talking about today? What are we trying to cover? What are we trying to accomplish? And, and for those uh, tuning in, I want to cover a little bit about just writing our towns because it is uh, it's a fascinating project. And we'll spend a little time just th looking at the writing procedure and, and some of the fun stories from your time doing that project and then the follow-up. But for uh, those tuning in, uh, the intriguing part of the Our Towns project was that it was looking at what makes a successful city and a successful hometown. And are there themes and through lines that we can connect uh, to, to create a larger narrative about our country? And then that was important pre-COVID, but uh, I keep saying post-COVID. We're not post-COVID. In, in the middle of COVID, these kind of, uh, these kind of stories are more important than ever. And so I really wanted to take today to look at just the economic realities going on in Main Street, mom and pop businesses, and just what does it take to keep uh, these vital segments of our hometowns flourishing. And again, from so many folks that are going to be coming and looking to today's talk, it's, uh, they're looking for really practical insights of what they can do in their hometown. So. Uh, I hope we can cover a lot of that today and, uh, and excited to, to get started. So does that sound good with you, Jim, Deb? Great. Uh, yes, that sounds great. Thanks. Well, I mean, so the, to kick off uh, the, the writing of our towns, um, what, I mean, tell us a little bit about flying across country, a little bit of the project, a little bit, I mean, this is like a, a wonderful story in and of itself. Um, I'll give you the short intro and then Deb will um, correct anything I've gotten wrong or, or add in things. So Deb and I have been together for a long time. We uh, met on a blind date when we were 18. That was longer ago for me than it was for Deb. We've been together for a long time and a lot of what we've done in our time together has been just hit the road. We, had a, we got married in England. We had our honeymoon on a work camp in Ghana. We raised our kids in Malaysia and Japan and China. So we've just enjoyed seeing things. And back in, uh, you know, now seven years ago in 2013, we took our, one of our other avocations, which is flying a little plane to, thought, to think, let's go to parts of the country that are usually just flown over as opposed to flown into. And we just started seeing uh, in places like the, where both of us had grown up in smaller town interior America saying what are the things that, that miss, generally miss the notice of the national news. We started doing that and after a while we began seeing patterns of the ways in which local resilience was, um, was sort of defying the divisiveness of national politics, which became a, a main theme of what we were doing. <laughs> Deborah. Yes, 
Yes, that's true. And, and the whole process of doing it was really a learning experience. At the very beginning, when we would go to a town, we wouldn't really, maybe we had a little bit of a mission of something we were looking for, but it, mm. the story of the towns never ever turned out to be the reasons that we went there. So it, there was a lot of hit and miss. We just landed the little plane, went knocking on doors for the usual suspects, somebody in city government maybe, and always the librarian because they know everything. Um, people in the business community and the schools and education. And then they, they really led us to the right people to talk to. And they were, they were the ones who initiated being so excited to talk about their towns. We were there to talk about what they were doing, what they were building, what they were finding, and, and not to talk about national politics. So that seemed to be um, a process that worked pretty well. Yeah. Did you find, what was the commonality of the leaders that you talked with? I mean, like what kind of resonated at the front end and then made you excited to just continue the project? I think that that it, in the beginning of this project, we had no idea, as Zeb was saying, what we're going to find. And we kept doing it for years and years and years, and we'll keep doing that when it is possible to, to travel again because of the richness and surprise and intensity of local involvement we saw in many places. Something I think we mentioned when we were with you all uh, two years ago is that whenever we went to a town, we'd ask people, we went sort of a, a we had a, a set a group of people we talk with, the newspaper editor or, you know, a school principal or a mayor or whatever. And we'd ask those people, who makes things go here? And the answers to that question went in unexpected directions. It could be a folk music specialist. It could be a small merchant. It could be a philanthropist. It could be somebody who was a high school coach or whatever. But seeing the intensity of this kind of locally involved patriotism and civic loyalty, civic inventiveness, that became a theme of seeing the different ways in which communities decided, we know who we are, we know where we've been, we know our challenges, and we're gonna to try to find ways to, to solve them. And I, I think one of the surprises was an answer to your question of who were the leaders. Sometimes they were conventional leaders, like the mayor or the city manager. Sometimes they were the person you'd expect least, uh, the music singers, the, the old town historian, a particular teacher, just somebody who had a real commitment and dedication to the town. And it wasn't usually just one person either, they, but there were a couple central figures who gathered in the rest of the people and made things work. But it, and that has actually also been an interesting lesson um, during this COVID era when we've been keeping in touch with a lot of people in, in the towns where we visited has been their, their focus on how do we bring, how do we train the next round of leadership? Because we might not be the ones who are here to see everything through. How do we bring in the younger people? How do we encourage mm -hmm. them and, and actually explicitly groom them into mm -hmm. these positions of leadership? So that's a huge topic right now. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I, 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 what you're saying resonates a lot with me. I and mean, we find the same thing with Tom. Tom. You know, we were in person the year you came, 300 cities were here at the festival. And it really is, it's economic developers, it's mayors, it's engaged citizens, it's philanthropists. It really is, you, you can't really put a, 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 a qualifier on it, except it's just boosterism. There's people that just believe in their city and they believe in their hometown, they can make it better. And that's a great animating force in this conversation. And I guess that's that's kind of what you're saying as well. And, and can, I, can I, Paul, just, um, the word boosterism is an interesting one because often in pejorative sense, that would mm -hmm. mean sort of blind enthusiasm, uh, you know, um, babbitry, you could call it, you know, a century ago in American culture. And a distinction that we found more and more important is that what um, I think of just uh, different kinds of optimism. There, there's the blind optimism that things will get better. And there's the conditional optimism that things could get better or things can get better. And mm. that is, is the version of boosterism we saw that we thought of as uh, local patriotism of conditional optimism of a sense that yes, right. there, was, there were possibilities and purpose. Yeah, it's a great point. And particularly with COVID, which is what we're getting into, it's, 
it's 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 we don't know there's so many unknowns there's so much uncertainty and it's not about blind belief that we're going to solve our all the problems but just we have to get started and do something and uh and that's a, that's a really good point something that just for our viewers um i'll put the context for this because i think this is uh an interesting background bit of context for the talk is that the cities, the type of cities that you all visited, under a million in population, are a third of the country. So 100 million people live in these smaller metros that are largely outside of the national discourse. So the Miamis, the New Yorks, the Bostons, et cetera. And Tom Tom has, has spent a lot of time focusing on those smaller metros. That's what your book is about as well. And I'm just kind of curious. I mean, before we get into the COVID resiliency, it does seem like a lot of articles right now are saying that there is not just a tremendous amount of interest already in small cities and like the demographic shift, but people are leaving bigger metros and going to smaller metros. So is that something that you have noticed as well? Yes, yes, we definitely had. I, I've had the, the real privilege actually of um, of zooming in to the state of South Dakota for since mm. March, a couple times a week. And there's an economic development group in South Dakota that's been convening these meetings for people around the state in all these, in probably many dozens of smaller mm. communities who come to talk about, um, talk about their, their issues, their problems, their solutions to crowdsource uh, mm. creativity and so forth. And one of the topics that has come up frequently in South Dakota is what are we going to do with about all these people who want to move here now? They want to move from the cities, which is one of my hometowns of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, and for a bunch of different reasons, some, want, some are actually um, entrepreneurial. They want to start their businesses there. Some are individuals who are looking to work remotely in a place that is that is uh, because why not? They can go there and they just feel better about it at this point. Um, some of them are looking for long stays like Airbnbs, but in, in some of the towns actually in South Dakota, they're having to build new RV parks because so many people are moving in. Um, and, there, and, and some are just tourists like the situation in Sturgis when all of the bikers came in um, for that rally. So th there have been a lot of conversations around how do we prepare for this? How do we manage this? How do we make it a good opportunity for us rather than something that, that we might fear? And, um, and the answers are really very practical. They range from, from um, the whole group together trying to put together some playbook of what to do or um, what, what do we need to do? We need to figure out who we are, what our assets are in terms of buildings or empty buildings. What are we gonna tell people who wanna start a, a business here? What about the tax base? What about the incentives for coming here? What about the utilities? What's all that gonna cost? And would people like it here to have a new bakery? That's been also an interesting um, sidebar conference among uh, conversation among the people in the towns. If there's a new little business coming, for example, a bakery, we, we need to be um, respectful and aware of the current bakery that's going to be there. Are they going to feel threatened or pushed out or will they welcome the, the competition mm -hmm. and how do we handle things like that? So, who, uh, who organizes that in, in South Dakota, you said? Uh, it's a group called Dakota Resources. And they, they have lots of different kinds of programs. And when, when the lockdown happened, well, when COVID happened and people couldn't get together in person, they started these virtual meetings that have been very successful. So they really run the gamut um, on everything from how do you get funding to um, what are we gonna do about the schools to I'm feeling depressed today uh, to, just everything. So it's, yeah. it's been an, an amazing reality check from our life in Washington, D.C. to be in South Dakota for a few hours every week. And that's a direct result from you, from the Our Towns Project. You met those it, leaders, they kept in it, touch, and are like, it is. yeah, here's, okay. Yeah. 
you know, there were places we were actually going to be there, just as we were going to be at the uh, your in-person session if it had happened this spring. We we're going to be there in a summer session, but of course, it all has become virtual. And I think that that to to answer um, just an extension, we were in about fifty towns before we wrote our book, and we've been to about fifty more since then, just trying to see right. the connections and patterns. So we're going to be writing more about this, and, and our film is also trying to extend these themes. Yeah, well, wonderful. We'll get to the film in a moment. I mean, what resonates with me a lot about what you're talking about in South Dakota is in the face of this kind of unknown scenario, what can local leaders do? And by the way, I, I'm looking at both the Q&A and the chat. I don't, I don't know if anyone is from South Dakota or could, okay, I see that there is a, actually a, a link, dakotasources.org, that is what you're referring to, the project you're referring to, Deb. Um, but here in Charlottesville, we had a we had an initiative called Project Rebound, which was a uh, actually just won some international facilitation awards, and it was spearheaded by our local chamber, uh, by our anchor institution UVA, uh, University of Virginia, um, and then our city and our county. And it was 300 plus participants getting together in a series of Zoom webinars, not dissimilar to this trying to like examine what can our, what keeps our arts alive? What keeps our anchor institutions thriving? What are the partnerships they need to be reaching out and working with? What can our government do? Um, and it was, a, it was a really inspiring project. And again, there's so much unknown. It's not like they've solved, we haven't solved everything, but it's, I think it has energized a wide swath of the community to think about what they can do. And I'm just curious, besides South Dakota, are there, are there other communities around the country that you're seeing really lean in in some innovative ways? Yeah, there, um, yes, is the answer to that. And so you've got sometimes these regional efforts like, like the amazing project, the, the, the Project Rebound that you all have got going on and in South Dakota. And then, then on, a, on a smaller scale, in a number of the towns, for example, Redlands, California, which is a very um, kind of active, um, uh, a lot of a lot of very engaged citizenry. I, I'll just put it that way. On a on a small and nimble scale, they they very quickly convened um, five or six different individuals from the town. This is a town of what sixty five thousand or so right now. Um, someone from the philanthropic community, from nonprofits, from the Chamber of Commerce, uh, from the city government, from the university, to talk about, okay, here in our town where we basically all know each other, what can we do with the problems that we have? One of the participants was from um, small business. And so we spent, I also listened in on, on their conversations. It, it was, at kind of interesting compare and contrast because they were so small, they knew everyone. So they didn't need a playbook. They just needed to pick up the phone and call somebody to, um, to help solve their issues or, or make new collaborations. So they would, one of the issues that they were focusing on is, is what do we do with the cheese walla, who is the sandwich maker and the brew pubs and a couple other small restaurants who are really struggling. How can they help each other out? How can we help them out? And the kinds of solutions are probably easier in a single small town than they are statewide. Mm -hmm. But for example, they, they, were, um, they, cut, they were able to cut through a lot of red tape and say, okay, usually we can't have restaurant, we can't have outdoor eating on, on these sidewalks, but we're gonna do it right now because everything's different. Or, I didn't used to need any kind of marketing because everybody in town knew that I was here. I don't know how to do it. So that particular business paired up with um, another one, like usually the brew pub who had, had a greater social uh, media reach. And they would together work on building their audience and collaborate on perhaps um, delivery of food. One was good at one thing, one was good at another thing, and they kind of shared their individual resources to help promote and push through what they needed to do. In, mm -hmm. the, um, in the philanthropies and the nonprofits, there was a lot of, of just, we need to keep in touch with our people. How do we st 
stay in touch when we're not having any events and we don't want to just say ask people for money so there was just a lot of give and take among the individuals in the town to crowdsource in a mini way their solutions right well I'm, I'm looking at the chat and i'm seeing and again i'll remind everyone that's watching on zoom there is both a q a for me to ask questions and then a lot of people are using the chat both of them are great i'll try to keep an eye on both um, Wendy Knight, what Deb is describing in South Dakota is what's occurring in Vermont, the Vermont Futures Project released results of a survey of people who moved to VT due to COVID. And then in the chat function, there is an extended HT, uh, there's a hyperlink that is too, too long for me to, to, to read off, but I'll just point people there. And again, for anyone that is watching these resources and, and, a, and a key point of what we're trying to do today is assemble the best thought leadership across the country, because you guys are constantly looking for ideas and communities to profile and and, and kind of the best practices across the country. Uh, Tom Tom is trying to do the same thing. So I'll just remind everyone viewing, you put the Q and A, put the chat, and, and we will, even if we don't mention it here, we will go back and review those notes because it's really helpful. Um, then, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I was going to say we would welcome um, new leads, new ideas, new contacts, and we will, you know, send our email address for all of you to to send um, uh, send suggestions to because you know the the payoff for us mm -hmm. is making these connections. I'll just say one of the thing in addition to what Deb was talking about in South Dakota and Redlands, probably the connective theme among communities we've seen that have been resilient in times these times of difficulty is knowing very precisely who they are, what their challenges are, what their resources are. And we've seen that extensively in the, the Danville region, you know, very close to you all in, in Southern uh, Virginia and, and Western North Carolina. We've seen it in ways I can give you details in Indiana. Indiana Humanities has been doing very ambitious things in the city of Muncie and city of Angola and in Fort Wayne, other parts of Indiana. And we've seen it in Tulsa in ways we can uh, talk about more. But I think a clear-eyed understanding of where a community stands in terms of its assets and its limitations and its potential has been a very important connective theme. Mm. That's very helpful. We'll, we'll get to the idea of community identity in a, in a bit, because that is one of the most prominent takeaways from the book from a few years ago, was just exactly that. What is the civic pride, civic identity? And it's, a harder thing to put your finger on every <laughs> these days. It's just where we have so much turmoil and so much unrest in our communities and there's increasingly lacks of trust that it makes it difficult to really say, here's what our community is, here's who we are. But I'm curious, well, I'm, I'm gonna get to that in a little bit. One of the questions that came through, um, Mary Trigiani, uh, who is actually leading a cohort from Danville. You just mentioned Danville. Oh. And we have a cohort from Southwest Virginia that uh, is, is, is next gen leadership. And they're here at the summit uh, and virtually, but they're kind of going through all of the programs we have to talk about what they, what they can bring back to their community. So anyway, Mary, who's part of that cohort said, did the Fallows see any examples of communities that use taxpayer funded grants to initiate new projects that then enabled towns to attract and absorb new businesses. Um, and, you know, and obviously not being a self-perpetuating cycle of dependence on grants, but maybe that's a larger question of even just private public partnerships as well. I know what you have yeah. some opinions on. Yeah, so, so one of the big things, and so I'll say, we really, we spent a fair amount of time in Danville and the surrounding areas of Virginia and North Carolina, and really were impressed by the ways in which those communities, which have suffered from the loss of textiles and tobacco and furniture, are reinventing themselves, dealing with all the different parts of their heritage and trying to have a new downtown identity, new economic uh, futures, and also, of course, the ways in which the, the Danville Regional Foundation has played a role there. One of our big lessons that, that we had not really focused on that much was this role of public-private partnerships, which can involve national investments statewide or, or even uh, local projects. And the, the locally funded ones can be things like parks or um, you know, river walks or bike paths or libraries or public art 
public art we've come to think of as a really important ingredient of how towns uh, develop. Uh, the statewide um, efforts can be in things like um, uh, career technical schools, which we think are really important parts of having new manufacturing uh, um, you know, bases. And then you see that in Danville also. And of course, national investments. Um, this in national politics, often the idea of these public-private partnerships has a kind of bad connotation of being payola or something. But we, we have just saw city after city, community after community, where they could say, yes, we turned around when uh, we had the downtown, you know, the new investment in the downtown, which made people want to, to move here again. We had different kinds of housing, which made it more affordable for younger people and lower income people. So yes, if there was a theme we believed in, it was different stories city by city, but the constant theme of shared public and private um, investment and NGOs and foundations for their collective future. Mm -hmm. One thing I have heard a lot about is in the COVID era is how do I find the money right now? Because there, there is money out there. There's federal money, there's state funds, there, there's just money floating around, but actually being able to identify that and apply for it and receive it and then figure out what to, what to do with it seems to be um, confusing. No, and no wonder, because, uh, there are some places that I think it's a very valuable thing when when people can assemble those resources in a single place so people from around the state or the region can go there and, and find out what's available and how do I do I qualify or what do I need to do. Mm -hmm. Just this morning, I was reading about an interesting initiative from Detroit and I'm going to have to look up the name of it and, and put it in your chat because it's the business model is you apply for a small project, like we want to build this park because we think a lot of people would come here and they need it right now and raise a certain amount of local funds. And then this group matches, matches them with funding that they know how to source. So you get a you know, double mm -hmm. for the money of what you invest individually. Um, that is and they'll help guide you through the process. So uh, there are even organizations out there that are, are starting to help people take the next step if there's something they need of figuring out how and where to get the money. Well, very helpful. Um, well, this, I think there's two, there's two components to this next question. One is just the city narrative sense of self. Let's, let's deal with that. That's actually a, a really helpful lens that I would emerge out of your last book uh, or in the book and uh, you, you use the anecdote uh, of Allentown the Billy Joel song that came out in the 80s and permanently uh, kind of painted Allentown Pennsylvania as a rust belt light city and it was really about Bethlehem <laughs> like that's really the scenario the song was about <laughs> and then Bethlehem escaped unscathed and then Allentown got you know, kind of known forevermore as this as this downtrodden city, and uh, and then you but you know more whimsically you talked about Burlington has this kind of crunchy, creative, sustainable vibe. Sioux Falls has this hospitable, uh, economic capital resource. Holland, Michigan, Michigan has a culture of creating, and you kind of like said there there were identities that each city created for itself. And I'm just kind of curious to hear more about that and what it is that, if you sensed a through line of how leaders did that. So, what are you going to talk no, about? No, no, I, I will let you, I'll talk about whatever you would like okay. me to. But. <laughs> uh, well, I'll give you an example of Fresno, which is a city that's undergoing a lot of change right now. It's always been a kind of rogue arts community, and it is newly a, a tech hub for especially a lot of people from Silicon Valley who want to lead, find a more balanced life and mm -hmm. have started collecting and moving to Fresno. So there is a, um, a group there called Bitwise that is a, a kind of tech training and execution company and then some. And the and then some is, is really reaching out to build this brand and this identity of Fresno as we are arts and we are tech. So over the last couple of years and increasingly now, 
the, the tech company will sponsor concerts in town where people go and you know have a beer and, and talk tech or whatever it is and, and bring in the arts community to that. Or they open up, um, they do training for kids either in high school or even younger where they'll teach them basic computer skills to kind of get them into the system of this is part of your community and it's really integral to it. So what, I, what we've seen in a number of places is either the, the historical, the, the traditional um, identity and brand, if you're an orange growing community, or a new identity and brand that's building up. And right now it seems to be something that is really advantageous to a town because it gives a focus to where you want to put your energy and your creativity right now and, and, and concentrate on building something that will help the town in this troubled time. Yes, and, yeah. I, and I, I agree. <laughs> and I, I will just, um, just add briefly two things. One is we all recognize there are parts of the country where people just live. It's just you know a suburb or it's a part of some big sprawling city where you might as well be living three miles away. It doesn't matter, and it is natural in those kind of uh, just just places of existence that people's interests are confined to their own household or their own life or their own welfare. But what distinguished most you know most smaller communities and a lot of the, mo all the places we went is they had some sense of their identity beyond that you just lived there. It was a place that gave some meaning to your family and your past and your future, and and uh, and that that gave you some responsibility for the world outside your own immediate house. You stepped out the door, and that wasn't the limit of your interest. There still were things that were going on. The other thing I'd say is that a surprising amount of the country has as its self identity a certain amount of grittiness or chip on the shoulder that the South in general, um, the Plain States in general, uh, the upper Midwest, um, Appalachia, uh, the Central Valley of California, Inland California, where I'm from, small towns in general have a sense of, well, those people in Los Angeles or Boston or San Francisco might think they're better than us, but we're going to show you. And mm -hmm. we found many, many local leaders use the we're going to show you spirit to say, we, we heard that very strongly in West Virginia and in Arkansas and in Mississippi and in Central Valley, California to say that we are, people may not know what we can do. We're gonna show you what we can do. Mm. And, and I would, would add on to what Jim says in, in this point, it, it's always been a critical element in the towns to to help them move forward. I think it's my sense is that it's even more critical now in in a kind of soft way that it gives people we all need a sense of pride and spirit raising at this point. And having having this identity of my hometown is such and such it plays a, a, an important role in just helping people feel better right now. Not only focus what they do, but but just like here here I am in this town, and I'm going to help do something, and and that will make make us not only do better but feel better about what we're doing. It mm -hmm. you know it I don't know how you can measure that, but I've heard I've heard that sense enough times in the last six months that I believe in it. Yeah. Well, it, it, that's an interesting, set. I mean, I, I want to talk, of course, about uh, you know, the, 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 the protest, the movement for racial justice that is a part of, a, a big part of the whole city's rising summit. This, this talk today is week three, we're looking at small business, but over the course of these seven weeks, we're looking at a variety of topics, and it's looking at COVID resilience in small cities. It's also looking at the protests that have been happening in our streets and, and a movement to make a country that's more equitable. And I think it's, one way to approach that is when cities have moments of reckoning that is going to have long-term impact on their sense of self and identity. And of course, I'm, we're, I'm, I'm dialing in from Charlottesville, Virginia, which had the, uh, the tragic events of August 12th uh, from a few years ago, and it really defined on the international stage our city's sense of itself. And I think in the years subsequent have 
uh, have been an ongoing source of dialogue and of just reckoning. I mean, there's no other way to put it. There's, we're not the same city we were before August 12th. And if I think about Kenosha, I think about other cities, smaller cities that are now in the national dialogue. And do you have any thoughts about what happens when a city has bad news? I mean, not even bad news, tragic news, news that it needs to face and reckon with? Yes, we've thought about that a lot. Um, as I mentioned early, Deb and I have spent a lot of our adult lives living outside the United States. And two of the things that I have learned about the US when seeing it from China or Japan or Africa or England or other places are these contradictory realities. One is that the United States has its, its, its historic defining burden and original sin and, and challenge the legacy of centuries of enslavement and everything that, that flows from that. We're not the only country with huge burdens of racial inequality, but it is the central burden of American history. The other simultaneous point is that compared with almost any other part of the world, the United States has the, <clears throat> the unique, the aspiration to be at its best when at its most inclusive and finding ways continually to make itself more open, more inclusive, more available to immigrants, to people of all backgrounds, people of all, <clears throat> all other circumstances. And the times in American history where the country and regions have done best is when they've taken moments of tension to move forward and to say, we will reflect on our history and absorb its, its realities and try to see how we can not, not forget them, but, but move forward. The times when the US has done worst is when it has, has suppressed those, um, those moments of, of clarity. Um, I was growing up in Southern California in the time of the civil rights protests of 1963 through 65 in Selma and Birmingham and leading to the civil rights and voting rights legislation. And that was some reckoning for at a national scale of what uh, the last you know centuries has has had done, Deb will tell you briefly in, in Duluth, Minnesota, how, how they, they've they've had a moment of reckoning. But but we have, I think that that Tulsa is the place where over the last couple of years, before the crises of the last year or so, uh, Tulsa, the scene of the largest you know race massacre in American history, 99 years ago they have been deliberately as a community trying to say, how will we recognize this in public art, in commemorations, in a museum, and find ways to say that, that what happened with the, the, the murders of Black Wall Street in 1921, how we can recognize that and try to, 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 um, to do better, which is, is the only thing that can be done. You, you could talk about Duluth. <laughs> Yeah, it, just about the same time as the massacre in Tulsa was a, a lynching in Duluth, Minnesota, believe it or not, um, of, a, of a, uh, three black men mm -hmm. who were in town to help man the circus that had come to town. And they were wrongly accused of, of a crime and broken out of prison and lynched right then and there, you know, with no, with no justice. So nearly a hundred years later, it's happened about 10 years ago. So let's say 90 years later, um, the town kind of went back to its conversation with itself that it never had about what they considered one of the worst things that had ever happened in this town. And together they started having group meetings and it led to a decision to, to build a section, a, a beautiful little park that was kitty corner to where the lynchings actually happened with a, a design by local artists of, of a representation of these three individuals. And they started a scholarship fund and they actually finally made headstones to put to mark in the cemetery where these three men were buried. Um, it, it, was a, it was a hard process for that town to go through. But it has now become, you know, a, a sense of, it's a place of, they created a place of healing specifically in that town. And every time we've been there, you go there and there are always people there who are sitting there talking about it. You can't not go there and not talk about what happened. So, you know, creating the physical, beautiful place to confront 
a really difficult thing, which is the same thing that is happening in Tulsa too. And in, in much of Mississippi in, in and this, other places. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so we can be in touch with everybody because there's so many illustrations of how communities are trying to deal with their past. Yeah, I mean, it, it speaks to that sense of, of identity that the city has, you know, and it's, it's creating markers, places of gathering, places of rem remembrance. These, these aren't divisive things. And they actually have a way of hopefully healing the community and also just having a, a sentiment of this is who we are. This is what we want to become. There's an aspirational quality to it. Um, yeah. yeah. I'll give another brief update here. I, at, at way earlier stage of my life, I used to write um, political speeches. I worked for Jimmy Carter in the White House. And I've studied political oratory since then. The speeches that stand out best in American history, and of course, Abraham Lincoln is the king of these, do so by recognizing the complexities, complexities and tragedies of our heritage. We are a country that has aspired to greatness and has terrible sins and cruelty. And recognizing both parts of that heritage, that, that's what American identity is at its best. And communities that can do that on our own level, they can have their own local Lincolns. And, and you know, hats off to the orators and, and the artists yeah. who are who play a huge role in this because they, the artists who build the parks or make the statues or draw the murals are the ones who can express for a lot of the rest of us um, uh, and an acknowledgement and an awareness and a yes, I get this that is is hard for individuals maybe to do themselves, but it's right there for them. So yeah. um, we've seen a lot of the arts communities step up at this point. And interestingly, one, one guy who was an artist himself said to me, yeah, th this, this is actually, these times of crises are comfortable for us because <laughs> we always live in discomfort. We're artists and we're always kind of uncomfortable. So we understand this and we can live with this and, and use this time more easily than a lot of other people. I, I just thought yeah. that was amazing. That's a great, that's a great point. That's very true. Not um, my point, well, but <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, I, I'm the messenger I of that point. Yeah. Well, you're a great messenger. Um, Liz Cervantes uh, has a question. Do you see any patterns in regard to ending racial inequity and injustice? And I'm going to kind of add two, uh, uh, two statistics that have, have framed how we've approached this small business week. Um, one is that the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, said that 41% of the 1.1 million black owned businesses closed in the US over Q1 and Q2. So nearly half of all black owned businesses uh, have been wiped out as a result of COVID. And in the same period, only 17% of white owned businesses. Um, a similar statistic that comes from Morgan Stanley just talks that says that minority and women owned businesses have 80% less capitalization than their male counterparts. So there's something here that is a trend in our country in every hometown that is ever present inequality due to racial uh, background and gender as well. And you, you all have in a lot of your communities maybe approached this more through Latinx immigration. A lot of your communities have really like made a hallmark of how do we create a welcoming atmosphere? How do we broaden the idea of entrepreneurship. So I'm kind of curious if you have a little bit of a thought of how inequity is, is solved across the country. So that is, um, as you know, <laughs> we appreciate it. And then of course is an enormous question for the next generation in American life. And got five that. minutes. Yeah, you're right. Okay, about five minutes. Um, <laughs> two quick points of, of, of background. One is it's notable that over the last two or three months as the economy itself has been in crisis, the stock market has generally been going up and almost all of the increase in the stock market has been a few concentrated, often technology related firms. And so this has been an acceleration of the sort of them who have gets uh, trend that we've known for, for quite a while, which intensifies the, the problem. The other is 
the a lot of the urban um, downtown renewal we wrote about over the last five or six years was led by small, often minority owned businesses that were reviving downtowns and light manufacture and all the rest. They've been the ones that have been especially hard hit. Um, the, the two general points I'll make for the task ahead of us. Number one, we are big believers in community colleges and career technical education programs as being the most important sort of mobility enhancing educational institutions of this moment. And I think new attention on them will be important. The other is um, at the next stage of national policy, you know, the US needs to recapitalize itself. And I think just as Franklin Roosevelt during the New Deal said, there was, you know, a third of America that was that was left behind. We have to recognize there are at least a third of America that is being left behind now and very consciously directed programs for for people who are uh, racial minorities who are in non big city parts of the country that has to be the next focus of national policy to uh, glue together all the, a lot of the local initiatives we've been trying to learn about and connect. I, I've seen a few germs of ideas that are starting to come out of the small towns and in the category of what can I myself yeah. do? What, what can we do as a, as a shop front in our town or a restaurant or a school system or just me myself? For example, in Eastport, Maine, which, had, which neighbors onto the Passamaquoddy Indian Reservation, um, they, the, the town has, has always um, I, I'm not going to say embrace because it, it's been it's been difficult to um, have these two communities meet. But there's been an effort on the part of both of them to work together increasingly. I would say, and um, there is a a small shop run started owned funded run by a small group of women in Eastport, Maine, population 1,400. Um, who who always uh, collect works from from all of the local people in town and particularly from the Native American community. Since their shop has had to be closed a lot of the time, they just now opened an online uh, version mm -hmm. of themselves and right. said that um, they're deliberately featuring all of the local artists, including the Native American artists, as much as they can right now, because you know it's part of their, their mission and operation to be inclusive. So mm -hmm. those who've, who've started out with a little bit of seed of that are doing it more in hyperdrive. And, um, and I would hope that others who mm -hmm. have not yet done that outreach, but are in a position to do similar things are also getting those same ideas. Yeah. It's yeah. It's called I if you want to go check the, it out. Mm. I thought that was one of the most interesting parts of our town was just the number of cities in surprising locations where if you looked at how they voted in the national election, you know, and again, like any of these kind of partisan political indicators, there were a surprising number of cities that defined themselves by their embrace of refugee populations, of welcoming immigrants, of expanding opportunity. And that was a hallmark of their city. And I realized we're, we're kind of running out of time on that, but that is a really powerful thing from our towns. And it's, it's really worth picking up the book, if only for that. <laughs> well, well I, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, again, speaking from, from the heart after, as an American who's been outside the country yeah. a lot, what distinguishes the country at its best is including people and thinking anybody can you know, can realize can, uh, can aspire to the American dream and communities that want to have a future have to make themselves open to. And a lot of the places that impressed us realized that their future was attracting young people, attracting different right. people, attracting people who felt left out and making them think this can be your home. Right. Yeah. Right. And just one quick example from that, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you know, 10% of the school population is refugees. The home, of course, of the now notorious Smithfield uh, pork, pork plant. Um, right. When COVID hit there really hard, that town hit the ground running because they've always embraced refugees and they had their systems in place to um, 
find the people who were victims of the COVID and their families and reach out to them individually through the schools, through the service organizations, through the churches to say, we are here to help you through this. What can we do? And through their very expansive medical community too. So it was, it was not surprising, but really heartening to see them right. immediately take off to support their refugee community. Mm. So we only have a few more minutes left. Um, and I don't want to forget about the Our Towns film on HBO. Um, and then the Our Town Civic Foundation, which you all are starting. And, you know, there's a, there's a question here in the chat from Jean Keithley. So did you see leadership traits unique to small town success stories? And that's exactly the type of thing that you're trying to accomplish with this project is what are the most innovative things? What are the connective tissues? And so talk a little about the HBO series and then the larger project you all are kind of yeah. taking on. So, so the film, we had the, the good fortune to spend most of last year making a documentary film with, with HBO with a really brilliantly talented, uh, you know, video team or movie making mm. team. So we traveled all around, we finished the narration, everything early this year, just before everything changed. Um, HBO uh, is going, planning to release this early next year. It'll be called Our Towns. And the idea is to say there is an American identity that is apart from, from all of the, the national turmoil we have. And that the story of this country is of people adapting to dislocations. We're seeing a new chapter of that now. What can we learn you know, city by city? So that, that will be out and we'll spread the word about that. We also have started a small um, little foundation called the Our Town Civic Foundation, whose goal for the foreseeable future is to help us sponsor journalism by people and, and reportage yeah. and connections about just the questions you're discussing here, or what are the techniques that can be learned, you know, from, from Fort Wayne to be extended to Fresno, and what can Danville teach Duluth, and so spreading those examples and how the leadership techniques can be taught. So mm -hmm. that, that's our plan. Well, it's very exciting stuff. And I, I know that our team, again, has appreciated so much your enthusiasm for TomTom Tom and sharing this project and just sharing your story here with us. So a big thank you, uh, first off, for that. We are very grateful. Thank you for your time. <laughs> we, we, are, we are fellow travelers to yeah. the, the TomTom Tom enterprise and proud of it. <laughs> Um, well, with that, I know that our, we, are, we are at time. I know our team has a concluding message that they're going to share. But again, a big thank you. Uh, it has been a tremendous uh, joy to see you guys again. Hope to see you in person. And, uh, and we will, as a follow-up to this, also just be sharing more about the Our Towns Project. Real quick, for folks that have been tuning in and would like to get in touch with you. I know there's like a, a handle on Twitter you guys use, or is that uh, putting you on the spot? Do you know? What no, it that, that's fine. So um, I have a Twitter presence at, uh, at James Fallows and simply um, jfallows at Gmail will get to me and, and we'll be happy to hear from anybody. And, and uh, my name, Deb Fallows at Gmail. Oh, yes. wow. This is, we, we got up close and personal at the end of this. One. This is uh, amazing. Um, well, uh, yes. And I would encourage everybody that is on this call to, to reach out to Jim and Deb and share some of those innovative things that you're seeing in your community. And I see Chelsea yes. joining us. Welcome, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. I just want to hop on to thank you, Jim, Deb, and Paul for such an incredible conversation and for sharing your insights and expertise with us today. Um, also, thank you to everyone who attended um, for being a part of this. If you enjoyed the session, please consider becoming a contributing member to the foundation. You can do so on our website, tomtomfoundation.org slash give. Tomorrow, we will host a talk with celebrity chef Tanya Holland and local entrepreneur Antoine Brinson about the future of the hospitality in industry and a panel discussion with the major funders and community builders from the ever resilient Detroit, Michigan about innovative ways to support business owners. We are now hosting a short meet and greet for anyone who is interested in <laughs> conversation. The link is in the chat and we're calling it a wind down. So please feel free to bring your favorite beverage and click the link in the chat to join. Finally, thank you like very much. <laughs>
without their support, <laughs> none of this would be possible. Um, today's session was brought to you by the Charlottesville Office of Economic Development and the City of Lunchburg. Thanks again. And we'll see you soon. Right. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.